So, Mark, thank you for coming in today. I feel like it's been a long time coming, getting you on Business Keeps On Dancing. I've wanted to get you on for a while. Um, and there's loads I want to ask you about today, so I'm hope, hoping you're up for a good chat. Well, I'm holding on to the seat. <laughs> thank you for inviting me on. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, oh, nice I'm intrigued to hear what it is you want to talk about today. So, I'll, I'll go easy on you. <laughs> so this, what we want to do with this series, it's called Under the Spotlight. And what we want to do is speak to the people who are in, well, you know, traditionally behind the scenes, putting together um, events and festivals. And I know your role covers a lot more than just events and festivals. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to understand is, I guess, how you landed in the role of a CEO, what it's like to run, you know, events and festivals and what, and what goes into it. Um, and just trying to learn the highs, the lows and, you know, what you've learned along the way. Yeah. which I'm sure there'll be there'll be a lot but I thought it'd be good to kind of just start off of like where your career started and how you've kind of landed in the role of where you're at now okay well what a journey it's been I never planned to be CEO at Manchester Pride I never planned to be CEO of, of anything yeah. so my career started um, when I was at university I went to university to study quantity surveying and um, when I was there uh, some of the lecturers were not the most encouraging telling us it's a dying trade um, and this is possibly not something that we, we want to stick with. So I questioned that at the time. And then during the summer of uh, after my first year, I got a job at a newspaper office selling uh, classified ads. And being at uni, being skin, and then being uh, in a sales environment where you could earn commission and earn pretty much as, as much as you could earn through the work that you put in, I realised there was, there was maybe a different direction for me to follow. So I left uni uh, and then headed into media sales from newspapers, went into radio, uh, worked at different radio stations around Manchester uh, in, in, in sales, then in promotions, in marketing, and then a little bit of broadcast as well. So I, was, um, I did traffic and travel for about 18 months or two years, and then a, a weekend show on, um, well, bits of a weekend show, I think it was on Galaxy Radio at the time. Um, and then I moved to Key 103, and as I moved to Key 103, there was a festival that used to take place in Castlefield called Deeper Cushion. And the promoters of Deeper Cushion came to meet with me one day to see how we could support them as a radio station. And they were looking for commercial partners, and, and I'd expressed an interest in supporting them or helping out in any way that I could. And ended up uh, stepping away from my, my, my job uh, in radio and going out alone to source commercial sponsors for Deeper Cushion. I then quickly built a reputation off the back of that uh, and started representing different festivals around the city. Um, got some great clients. In fact, got flown over to LA to do an event in LA once. Um, because, yeah, off the back of some. The job. <laughs> yeah, it was a good perk. Um, first class as well, let oh, me tell you. Yeah, they, they had a great airline sponsor. Any jobs going? That was my first tight taste of the high life. Yeah, my only one since. Um, well, anyway, because, because of the, the work that I'd done with Deeper Cushion and then Jazz Festival, Food and Drink Festival, um, I started working with Manchester Pride as a client of mine. And I worked with them, I think, for over, I mean, I'm, I'm going to blur the, the, the years because I'm still in denial about just how old I am today. <laughs> so I worked with them over the years in the guise of commercial sponsorship consultant. Um, and then they appointed a CEO um, back in, I think it's around 2012, 2013, um, at a time where I'd been operating as a, as a freelance consultant for, for, I think, about eight or nine years by then. Um, and it was interesting to watch how the organisation was, was changing, uh, how the events that they deliver um, had kind of become static and, and weren't moving forward or weren't really innovating in the way that I, I would have expected or, or certainly the way in which we innovate events today. Uh, the CEO uh, was in position for, I, I think, around a year and they, they stepped down and then there was an opportunity, um, the, the, the chair and some of the trustees had asked me if I'd be interested in applying for the role. I wasn't interested at all. It was the last thing I wanted to do. For me, I just thought that was definitely not the role for me. Uh, and I enjoyed the independence of, of not having a boss and not being accountable to anybody apart from myself. Well, anyway, I bounced the idea around with a few of my friends and I quickly realised how much of a passion I developed for Manchester Pride, for everything it stood for. And given that I'd been wrestling with my identity around the same time, um, it, it just became a no-brainer. I quickly realised that I was probably the best place person to put myself forward for the role because I've been involved with it, the organization for such a long time um, as one of my clients. So threw my hat in the ring um, and got the job. And then I've been doing it now for eight years and it's been quite a journey. Yeah, eight years, wow. What, what was your thought process like going into that, you know, 
your first kind of day or week as, as CEO of a, of a charity as big as, as Manchester Pride? Well, it was really interesting because whilst I was talking about my, my Build the Lion career, behind the scenes and since I was younger, there's a lot of things that I was been, I've been involved in uh, when it comes to events. Um, I was a wannabe club promoter at the age of uh, 17. Uh, me and my best mate thought we were superstars uh, at that time of, of some of the <laughs> some, some of some of the uh, early days of uh, what we, what we were hoping were, were cool club nights <laughs> starting to uh, arrive in and around Greater Manchester. So I'd always, from an events perspective, had hands-on experience of events. Um, I knew the event scene in in Manchester, and at that time when I joined Manchester Pride, it was more of a the role that I was stepping into, I'd done an interim role as, as a director, and it was almost um, much more hands-on in terms of being the promoter for the festival, um, and almost a festival director role. Um, and then when, when I stepped into the role, I, I quickly realised what the opportunity was and what we could do to strengthen the, the work of the charity, um, to, to respond to what it was that, that our communities wanted from us, by delivering events that were innovative, forward thinking and as inclusive as they could be. It was pretty daunting, um, but one of the first things that, that I did was was um, hoisted up the blinds, opened up all the doors, asked everybody, what, what do you think of, of Manchester Pride? What do you want from Manchester Pride and, and in what direction should we go? And we've done that every year since. It has, you know, it has ups and downs. Sometimes people want to engage, sometimes people don't want to engage. But the way in which we've delivered the, the programme of events over the years has been led by what it is that, that our communities, who are essentially our ticket buyers, tell us that they want to see from the events each year. OK, brilliant. So it's, it's a pretty high pressure role, it's fair to say. Like, who guided you through that process? Was it just kind of learning on your feet? Like... Yeah, I mean, this was my first role as a CEO. And then heading into charity work uh, as a as a charity CEO as well, it was fraught with challenges, and it was completely new to me. I'm, I'm commercially driven, commercially motivated. So for me, from a business perspective, I could see what needed to be done to make the charity successful, so that it could achieve its objectives. But then the sensitivities of working with a charity and and with um, with communities who were so passionate about the events that you are tasked to deliver. That was a rude awakening for me. Um, I was really pleased that I was, I was so open and transparent from day one as to, I'm new in this job, I've not done this before. Come along on the journey with me, let me know what it is that you would like to see me deliver as your CEO of this organisation. Um, and then I will innovate, I will create ideas and I will pull in people to support the work that I do to deliver that. So it was a very small team when I joined. We're still a small team, but there were three, three, you know, three core staff members and then I joined, uh, so there were four of us, and that, and that, that shortly went that uh, shortly afterwards went back down to three, and then everybody else that we brought on was was freelance contractors. At the time that we got closer to our events, um, we had a board. Obviously, we're accountable to a board of trustees, being being a charity. But it pretty much was a case of right here you go, you're in position. What are you going to do? Get to it. Yeah. So it was. A, I love a challenge. So it was. It was a big challenge, and there were a lot of detractors um, at the time of change that I stepped in, because um, when things are great, you have a lot of supporters who are avidly screaming and shouting. When things are not great, you have a lot of supporters who are screaming and shouting, but for different reasons. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of work to do to to rebuild bridges, but to constantly remind people that that I'm, I'm, it's quite different with the charitable organisation. I am the boss, I'm a custodian for the organisation, but I don't own it. Yeah. Um, and that was the difference in, in, in decision-making processes, whereas when it's your own, you can do what you want. You're not really accountable. Yeah. Uh, being in the charity role was, was quite different. And, um, so what, what does that process look like from the board of trustees and then down to you kind of down so the, to the team? So the board of trustees is responsible for overseeing the, overseeing the, the the strategy of the organisation, yeah. making sure that the charity is doing what it needs to fulfil its objectives and that it's appropriating funds to match those objectives. Um, once we, we embark upon a journey of figuring out the strategy which is led by our stakeholders, I'll put forward a proposal to, to trustees, we'll develop strategies together, they'll approve a strategy and then they'll say, right, okay, they'll hand it over to, to the exec and their team to deliver that. So I'm responsible for the operation of the business, for delivering the strategies and making sure that we can achieve our aims as outlined with the strategy. Mm. And the board is then uh, has oversight of that and is responsible for making sure that we're following the track um, that we've outlined and, and we're doing what we said we would do. 
I think leadership is, is a key theme that comes through here and that's the main reason that I wanted to get you on because whenever I think of leadership you're one of the first names I, I ever think of and I've, I've always learned so much from you just kind of you know being around you and being able to work with you on different things um, and I think I try and think like what what is it that makes you kind of able to do that role and I think a big part of it is is, is listening you know you've got a whole community there that have different ways that they want to shape what the charity looks like what, what the events look like um, but leadership I guess you've got such a unique set of, of, uh, of skills of personality traits like have you always had that were you on the playground bossing people around <laughs> have you learned it from experiences like where's that come from those those leadership qualities right okay let me pick myself up off the floor because that was quite <laughs> an opener thank you that was such a that was a re really complimentary thing to, to say Sean um, and you've put me at ease there so you're going to get the best out of it <laughs> you know what you're doing I warmed you up <laughs> yeah uh, so I, I guess I, I never really realised self, self reflection is something that I never really possessed um, and over the past uh, three to four years um, I've, I've, I've learned to self respect uh, to self reflect and, and understand a bit more about who I am so so when it comes to leadership I'd never really thought about the leadership qualities um, that I had um, I was just doing my job and I was just focused on doing the job the way that came naturally to me I didn't realize that I was being a leader I didn't realize that I was uh, using the, the natural the natural attributes that I've got as part of my character to help forge a team, inspire others and lead an organisation. So for me, it, it happened very naturally. Um, when I look at, at, at leadership now, and I've done a lot of reading, um, you know, being, being at the size and scale of the organisation that we've got now, creating the profile that we created for, for, for the role of CEO within our organisation. And just because Manchester Pride is, is, has such an elevated platform globally, has made me more consciously look at who I am as a leader. Um, I like to inspire others. And, and when I look back now, yeah, I was a bit bossy maybe when I was younger. <laughs> I had life experiences that chilled me out a little bit. Um, and then there were some that knocked my confidence along the way as well. Yeah. But I've always been clear on on knowing that I I have if I focus and I have I, I, I work hard, then I will achieve what it is that I set out to achieve. Yeah. Um, and the way in which I, I like to, to do that is, is through collaborative leadership. I like to inspire others. So I recognise my talents, my skills, my abilities and my limitations. And I also know that I don't know everything and I don't have any aspirations to know everything. Yeah. Uh, I know what I know and I love to learn. Um, but there are other people who are much more skilled and experienced in different fields of what it is I need to achieve. Yeah. Um, so I love bringing people on and listening to them. Um, and challenging them with a, you know, with a set of goals and, and some unrealistic challenges. Uh, I can be entirely unrealistic, <laughs> uh, you would think, but then they achieve them. So I'm like, yes, yes, yeah, it's exactly. working. <laughs> um, but I do, it, it is, I guess, I am a good listener and I never really realised that I was. I, I've always been with, you know, with my mates, I've always been the person that, that, that will listen. Um, and then throughout my, my career, I realised I've learned a lot because I listen and I give people the time. Yeah. Um, and, and, and now, when I, it's interesting because you get to, to a stage in your career and you become aware of leadership, you know, when I've had to look back at, oh, wow, I've been invited to the table of all these meetings. OK, I'm put alongside this person who I uh, i am in awe of or, or, or whatever in terms of profiling within the city and, and, and within the UK and within the context of the work that I do. I almost, uh, I, I, well, I did have imposter syndrome. Why am I here? Yeah. How did this happen? And what are you sure that they want to talk to me? Yeah. What have I got to offer? Just that lack of self-realization of what it is that I've achieved through the support of my team and through the focus of the vision that, that, that we pulled together. Um, I've thrown myself off track a little bit there, waffling. Um, <laughs> but I think I think listening is um, is some it's a value. Well, I guess with leadership, I feel like some people are quite naturally born with with certain skills and and kind of certain traits. For me, it was something I felt like I had to put a bit more work into it. And I guess for years, I think the three main values that I I really try and live by is is listening, empathy, and accountability. I think is is a big one, but listening I find so fascinating because there's not that many people that do it well and I think it's such a it sounds so simple on paper and um, but I read a really great uh, article recently 
um, which talked about bad arguments, which isn't to say like it's a, it's a shouting match, it's more of like a debate. Uh, and it went into the idea that bad, ar bad arguments are harmful to everyone involved in a debate. And the reason is because if we're not trying to understand the other person's view, it just becomes like ping pong and tennis and you, you're both never going to get to the end of it. So this article, article spoke about kind of different ways to have a bad argument. So you can kind of, if you set your argument up for someone else to never understand or never be able to criticise it, you know, you're not on the right path. There's a quote from it that um, that always stuck with with me that said, "We can't, we cannot say we understand an op um, opponent's position unless we would be able to argue in favour of it so well that the observer would not be able to tell which opinion we actually hold." And one of the main takeaways was that until you can argue someone's point back to them better than they they even articulated it in the beginning, it's almost like you haven't even got a ground to have that debate, and it's really kind of absorbing. That perspective and then if you look at your role at, at Manchester Pride and the CEO you've got so many people coming at you with different thoughts and different ways that they want to do things so I guess your role and some, I think something that you've you've showed a lot and we'll, we'll go through the um the consultation that you've um, you rolled out recently is, is constantly having to listen and not just having your own views and thoughts of what you want to put forward but being able to, to take that from your team from the community from the board like yeah. it's a lot to manage isn't it it is a lot i'm going to pick up on a couple of things you said there um, you mentioned the word values and this is something that i've only really realized to reflect on recently so you've you've highlighted through the key values that you like to abide by and and, and that's clearly what you map out and they're important to you yeah um i think i did that as well but i did it incidentally i didn't realize that that i was doing that yeah. And then when I went through that values exercise uh, of being coached, because uh, at a certain part of my career, I thought, you know what, I need to... <laughs> when I was going through that imposter syndrome, I was like, I need a bit of coaching. Yeah. How am I a CEO? I've not trained for this. How, what, what's happened? There's not a manual. Yeah. There's not there's, a manual. There's the and there's one. no CEO training school. You know, you don't go to college and then become a CEO. Yeah. Uh, I learned on the job. <laughs> but, but then having some coaching made me very self-aware. Um, and, and I realised that I was making decisions based on my values before I realised what, yeah, what my values same. were. And I adhere to them and, and, and I keep my integrity close to my heart. It's in everything that, that I do. Um, the challenges of listening to lots of different stakeholders and have lots of different views of people who think they know how to do what you do better than, than you do um, has been an interesting one. Um, but it's something that, that I, I kind of relish. You know, it does come back to, to, to listening. Um, some people don't really, some people will have a view and a perception of you from a profile that they see. And yeah. then if I sit down to somebody and have a brew with them, they're completely shocked with the person that I am, you know, from against versus what they've heard or the perception that they've created about me because of an article that they've read or a picture that they've seen or, yeah. or how I've dressed on a particular day or what sandwich I bought from a shop. I'm not joking. Some of the stuff you see and read is just quite ridiculous. Um, but it shows you that level of interest that people have in the cause that, that I support. Yeah. Um, and it is listening to, the, to all the different views. I have to filter through those views that are going to help us get to where it is that we need to get to. And where we need to get to is based on what it is that our communities want from us. Yeah. Um, the day that I stopped listening is, is the day that things just would not work. Um, unfortunately, there were times whereby how much, no matter how much you listen, if people want to challenge the decisions that you have to make, then they're going to be ferociously against those decisions. And, and it can sometimes make people feel disconnected. But yeah, I, I am a listener. And, and, and the success that I've had at Manchester Pride is through authentically sitting down, taking time to listen to what it is that people want from, from what we deliver. And there are so many stakeholders. You've got our communities, you've got the board of trustees, you've got commercial partners, you've got the city as a whole. There, there, were, lot, there were lots of influencing factors and lots of voices that you got to listen to. But I love talking to people and listening. And, and I like what you said. If you, can't, if you can't argue passionately somebody else's opposing view, then that does tell me that you're not really listening. Yeah. What I didn't realise, what I didn't realise personally, was that everybody couldn't listen and wasn't a good listener. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize, again, I, I, blind, I blindly went through, through my career progression just being me, assuming that, that everybody else had the same skills and attributes and qualities that, that I had. Yeah. Um, and it's been interesting to, to, to realize that learning can be quite hard to, uh, listening can be quite hard to learn to do yeah. if you're not used to doing it or if it doesn't come naturally. So that's been interesting for me as well. There's a, there's a really good TED talk um, by a lady called Celeste Headley and she talks about 10 ways to have a better conversation and it's so simple. Um, yeah, I de definitely recommend watching it. But one of the quotes she mentioned was Buddha um, who says, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. <laughs> and it just basically means you just you just have to listen and really try and understand someone else's point of view because you're not going to kind of learn someone else's um, thoughts on it. I guess off the back of that, 
something I've, I've noticed is, you know, you, you have to do a lot of press and media and interviews to explain the decision, like the decision making process. Is that something that's important to you to, to communicate how, how those decisions are landed on? Um, it's really important, but I'll let you into a secret. Um, when I first took this role on, I was so hesitant to step in front of any media or even to go out there um, and network in the way in which you would expect from a CEO as the face of an organisation. I've always much preferred to be the person that sat in the office doing the graft, focusing on, on delivering the work. That's my most comfortable place and that's that's I thrive in, in, in an environment where I can just lock myself in an office, crack on with the work um, and then watch the results unfold as I'm implementing plans. So for me that was the most that was the most challenging thing to do when I first stepped into the role. Um, Does anyone prepare you for it? No. Wow. So there really was no preparation. Uh, there were, I had some great support. So we worked with a good friend of mine, uh, Daisy Whitehouse, um, came on board with us from, from the um, offset of when, when we started to initiate our first campaign. And I was, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a trained actor, so, so I'd had some experience of being on stage, being in front of cameras, etc. Um, but not really being in front of the media in an interview situation. So we did, when, when, when we were setting up our first um, public open forums, we, we did spend like a couple of hours of, of, you see it on telly sometimes when people are being media trained. Yeah. Not media trained. But uh, where I sat in a chair and she was throwing these questions at me and I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is intense. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, how I'm going to be in, in this situation. And almost thought that I had to put on a character or act in a certain way. Yeah. Um, I quickly realised that I couldn't do that and it wasn't sustainable for me. And, and as soon as I let go of that and just relaxed and sat down into a chair and, and listened to what it was that I was being asked and responded with what I knew. And not being afraid to say if I don't know or if there's something that I need to go and refer back to. Um, it, it, it helped me to, to connect with uh, media and people all of a sudden saw that what this person is saying is authentic and what they're doing is exactly what they said they would do so we've created a profile i guess well i say we um I, I, yeah we i, I work with the team we, we've created a profile for, for my role and for me in this role but it's based on me being who i am and being comfortable talking to people about yeah. what it is that we're doing it's really it's been really um important for the organization that connectivity to be able to talk about who we are what we're doing and why yeah. And and for me, I guess now I've become very comfortable um, with the media, Un unless I'm facing. There are times where, by you know, there, there, there's maybe trauma that I'm facing in my own personal life, or think experiences I've got away from work that might have impacted um, a couple of interviews that I've that I've had in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in 2021, that happened. Yeah. Um, but generally, it, it's something now that's become part and parcel of my role. You know, I, I can. We host a number of events, and we invite many. Um, champion and uh, people who champion what it is we do our allies and supporters um i could have you know be attending a media event or hosting an event where, whereby we have um we have the, the the mayor of great manchester attending i i, I get invited to, to events with with i'm not with with the current but with former prime ministers and then with then with with management and with artists um global artists who we might need to do a, a media interview with so the type of people that, that i'm placing a room with it varies so much yeah but every time i walk into that room i just think about why i'm there and what i'm representing and what the cause is that i'm supporting yeah and that helps me just to relax because i know what i do and I'm, i know why i do what i do and i can talk about it all day long as you'll know i'm not shut up now for the past <laughs> three or four minutes <laughs> it's, it's so interesting though like i'd love to know what a week looks like in like the life of a ceo of manchester pride like what that is the hardest like? thing for me to articulate because there's not a typical week and it really is i i love the work i do because i'm passionate about the cause and i can see the change that we've inspired since i've been in the role and i'm really really proud of that i've got to say you know some of the legacies that i will leave behind should i choose to step out of this role i already know i'm, I'm proud of um but when it comes to the work that we do or what, what i do uh, i've got a brilliant assistant who manages to to manage my calendar in a way in which i could only dream about <laughs> because i'm crap at all I'm crap. i just i would I lose track all the time um what does a typical week look like for me it's really important that i spend time with my team so i make time to, to sit down with my team whenever i can yeah um but i'm i'm so involved in many different things so or, do, or does it does it progress throughout the year because i guess some of the distraction comes from the kind of August bank holiday celebrations, but there's so much stuff and I've seen it firsthand that happens all year round, whether it's events or listening yeah. groups or 
there's so many initiatives that, that you've got going on like does it yeah how do you phase them throughout the year like what does the, the calendar usually look like there's there's so much going on so the, a lot of people tend to think because people have when you say Manchester pride people think about the festival and what it is and what it means to them um and what their experiences of of it are or what they've seen in, in the media and then for a long time um after starting this job people ask me what what do you do from september and the rest of the year <laughs> that was a question that i used Good to get one. asked all the time and even now some people don't fully understand that as a charity we've got a team of people who are working hard to deliver yeah. initiatives all year round but also it takes about 14 to 16 months to plan a festival so, so my team is always working on the festival for the following year and by the time we get to the 2022 festival they'll already have plans laid out for 2023 um, basic plans um, or, or, or infrastructure outlined um, with options of different things that we can do and um, so let's kick I mean if you look at the calendar year it's really odd for us our years fly by I think that's why I don't realize how long I've been in the role it, it flies you get to August I mean we're what four and a half five months away from our festival now yeah. and then we're into the autumn and then we're doing our wrap-up and then we're focus on another and it's the delivery of other initiatives strategizing yeah. and then all of a sudden it's February March again and I'm like wow okay we've got five months to go before we're delivering this so the months fly by um, and it is incredibly busy when we get to you know we, we, we hit May June all focus and all eyes are on the festival and what we're doing then yeah but there's never really a quiet time if i'm honest you know yeah. you'd expect me even around christmas to be quiet but that's one of our busiest times and you've got the conference coming up soon yeah so the conference is on the 22nd of march yeah uh, it's a really important event it's an event that we created back in 2019 with our first physical Manchester Pride conference then and then we had to go virtual in 2020 and 2021 but it's an opportunity for businesses and organizations to come together to understand what the modern pride movement is about and to consider what they can do and how they can impact on, on the fight for, for the greater equality for LGBTQ plus people. It's, um, it's a free to attend event and, and I'm always encouraging as many different people to attend as possible. Um, no matter what you do or who you are or what uh, for a living or what you represent, there's something that you can take away from attending the conference. It's a free event and you come away with tools and learnings about what you can do in your life to help society more accepting for LGBT plus people. Yeah. I'm really excited for that. And, and some of the speakers that we have, they are, are incredible. You just wouldn't see them in the same room in any other context. So yeah. I'm excited for that. Don't ask me if you are. Do not put me on the spot. <laughs> Check out ManchesterBride.com for all information. <laughs> good, good opportunity for a plug. Um, so yeah, I guess speaking about the, um, the festival and, and the, the celebrations that happen across the bank holiday and all of the um, the support and events that, that go into that, you've just gone through quite a big consultation. Um, Pride in our future. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit more around where they come from, what the process was? And yeah, the absolutely. Through? So we go we go to consultation with our uh, communities and our audiences every year. So yeah. we do this in a number of different ways. We have our post-event surveys, we have listening groups, and we have community sessions throughout the year. In 2021, we took uh, the decision um, to restructure our grant-making uh, strategy. We were kind of forced to do this. Um, by a number uh, of different influencing factors, and none the least, um, the pandemic put us in a situation where we weren't able to generate the same kind of revenues we'd done previously because we didn't have any physical events in 2020. Um, and then the governance review that we had as an organisation told us that we needed to, to sharpen our pencil and re realign um, what, how we appropriate our funds with what it was that our communities were telling us they, they wanted. Um, and then uh, on, on the way in which this was handled, uh, unfortunately news was, was put out there in a way in which before we were, we were fully prepared to talk to our communities about what it is that we do and what decisions have been made and why. And we made some decisions that, that were, were particularly unpopular um, and I believe that they were misunderstood, not, you know, not all of the facts were put out there together. Uh, and there was no narrative from Manchester Pride as to why we had to make the decisions that we were making. We didn't have the time to do that. We had a plan in place, but this news was put out there be before we could respond to, to that news. Uh, and I don't mind sharing with you, um, there, were, I, uh, there was things that I was experiencing away from work at the time that, that meant that I was not able to fully focus 
um, on, on my role um, and, and on being this profile that everybody has become to know and expect to, to be talking about. Um, so I was quite distracted with, with some quite harsh traumas in, in my own life. Uh, that meant there was this void, uh, as I've spoken about earlier, we, we created a, a profile for me in this role. So everyone's used to saying, oh, look, we'll, get, we'll get him in, Let, let's ring him and ask him what he's got to say because you know, we know we can, we can have it directly from him. I wasn't really in the best headspace to do that, and I don't feel that. I, I, looking back, I probably shouldn't have done at any of the interviews. I certainly was not uh, prepared for some of the questions that, that were put towards me at that time. Because of the misinformation that was out there, I was having lines of questioning about things that were just quite ridiculous. I had a journalist on the BBC asking me why we spent money on VAT, and I look back at this thinking, what, what we, how. What are you asking me questions about VAT for? And have you not done your research on 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 the you know the, <laughs> on VAT and taxation before asking me why I was spending two hundred pound two hundred thousand pound of that? Well, it's a legal obligation to do so, you know. But I guess that at the time that that really threw me, um, and people were wondering where you know what are you doing with your with your charity funding? What's what? Completely forgetting that we didn't have an event in twenty twenty, so yeah. we didn't make a single penny. So we had to limp through the pandemic like many other organisations, find a survival strategy to get us through so that we could be there at the other end to deliver our events yeah. um, that we know are much needed by our communities. Um, so there was um, a backlash, uh, we, we should call it, um, off that announcement. Uh, and our not being able to respond to it as quickly as, as, as I would like to, if I'm honest. And we just didn't get some things quite right. You know, our communications were heavily reliant upon me being there to talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not in that space of being able to do that, it meant there was this void. Yeah. And within the void, people started to ask questions and, and complete fill in their own narrative and respond their own questions. Um, by the time that, that we were able to, to respond, we got some information out there. Um, but at that point, for me, it was really important that we we had to reconnect with our communities and our stakeholders, not only firstly to reassure them, but to let them know that every decision that's made by our organisation is based on what we are told and asked to do by our communities. And then we, we have to evidence that, you know, and we did evidence it. Um, but what we pledged to do, because some of the disillusion with, with some of our partners and our stakeholders, um, as an organisation, we said we pledged to do a radical review of our activities, to consult with all of our communities and all interested parties, um, to decide what we do as an organisation to move forward, what should Pride look like as, as an event, and, and how we can make sure that we're best serving our communities through the appropriation of our funds and our grant schemes. So we pledged to do that and it was a real opportunity to go further and wider and engage more people than had previously engaged with us because when things are good, people are content and happy for you to roll on with what you're doing. Yeah. When things are brought into question, they quickly become bad. People have many things to say and we wanted to harness and harvest those voices and make sure that everybody felt they could come and talk to us and say that. If you don't like something that we're doing, come and talk to us. Yeah. If you've heard something and you're not sure about it, come and ask us. So we embarked upon our biggest con consultation, Pride in Our Future. Um, it was multi, um, there were many different strands that people could uh, access this consultation with. So you could take part in a survey, you could attend uh, an online listening group, you could attend an in-person forum, uh, you could call a um, dedicated free phone line, you could send in an email. And, and it was structured, we brought on an independent uh, research agency, Mustard Research, to work with us again, just to show transparency and to make sure that, that, that everybody could see that, that this was not going to be led by Manchester Pride. We were bringing somebody in to, to act independently to, to help us um, cipher through all of the different views, thoughts and feedback that we, that we would get. So we closed the consultation and we had over, I think over 5,000 people that engage with us as this. And for me, that is incredible to have that level of engagement from switched on people who've got something to say. It is massively powerful. I mean, it took a long time to decipher yeah. all of that data and all that information. It's crazy that that's the sample size from what I imagine is a community of hundreds of thousands yeah. of people potentially in, in Manchester. It what is. Was that? Is it, does that reflect the barriers? That it yeah, takes it does reflect level. the barriers, and I can tell you now that ordinarily, you know, when it comes to our post event surveys, uh, given that we have what quarter of a million, maybe two, three hundred, four hundred thousand people engaging in activity with us at the festival, we normally get up to two and a half, three thousand people responding to our post event surveys. 
Um, when it comes to gathering data, a research agency said that that's an astounding response that we've had. Um, they, you know, they were surprised to see that we would have any more than six to seven hundred people. They feel they could get the quality of data they needed from that. So for us, it was a phenomenal result um, to be able to get get all these voices. We tracked. Uh, we we then obviously took time to go through all of the the responses that we had and to make sure that we could deliver what it was that our communities wanted us to deliver. We outlined a set of commitments in a report that we published last month. And we're going to adhere to them. That's that's helping us to stir the ship in, in the way in which our communities want us to. Yeah. Um, and we made some radical decisions off the back of that. You know, the festival in 2019, we introduced MCR Pride Live. That's the year we brought Ariana Grande to the city, uh, back to the city to, to, to celebrate with us as one of our staunch allies. And that event program was massively successful. It was off the back of what our communities had told us they wanted to see from us. And the response at the back after the, after the the, the events we delivered were that they wanted more of that then the world changed mm. uh, and the response that we had in this consultation were people questioning why we were delivering MCR Pride Live today how is that relevant why are we paying for pop artists to come we should be supporting our charities um, elevating local talent focusing on local queer issues um, so we took the, the bold decision not to deliver MCR Pride Live this year and we're going to be focusing our activities in and around, you know, uh, we are very fortunate to have the gay village that we have in Manchester and we deliver a massive event within that area. So we'll be focusing the celebration aspect of our, of our um, events in that area and the programming will be very different. We want it to be queer led. We want to be focused on what it is to be a modern pride movement today. Um, however, the event and the impact of the event will still be on the same magnitude that it was in, in 2019. We yeah. deliver a globally renowned celebration of pride. We literally bring the city to a halt to march down the thoroughfares of our city centre yeah. for greater equality um, and protesting for freedoms um, that we fought to have and, and that will continue to exist. Um, it's going to be very different but for me this has been a great exercise whilst it, it, it's not been the easiest challenge and, and it's been very difficult for my team because there were some, re there were some very very harsh um, comments made shall we say online and, and very um just untoward comments there was a lot of nonsense that we had to deal with that was unnecessary and that is not okay and i'll be really clear about that when talking to anybody that is just yeah, not how, how does the team deal with that one um we we close ranks we pull together you know we, we I've, i'm really pleased that i'm surrounded by a, a group of passionate individuals who are just it's not the way to say it, they're just bloody brilliant and they're committed to what it is that, that, that we do as an organisation and they are highly skilled in their own fields. Yeah. We just had to pull together and support each other, you know. I think that's what's really quite unique with our team is every, everybody's very aware of their own mental health status or anxieties that they're experiencing and, and, and their team is experiencing around them. So yeah. we just, we held each other together, checked in with each other to make sure that we were okay and then followed the, the safeguarding, um, the wellbeing practices that, that we have as an organisation that we chose to have as a team. And uh, I'm really pleased to, to see us get through it the way we did. We are scarred by it, you know, some of, some of the things, that, some of the personal attacks that we had on social media. Mm -hmm. It was fueled by those who really should have known better. Um, and it's clear for, for many to see that there were some really poor behaviours of those who really should have stepped out and been more supportive in understanding what it was we were doing as an organisation. Yeah. But that's why this consultation is a great lesson for, for those detractors to understand um, that what, what we say we do and that's who we have been since I've been in this organisation. Yeah. We will listen, we will learn and we will respond with what we can do based on what it is that we've learned and yeah. if there are limitations to that we'll say what we can and can't do. I read the report it was it was and the thing that stood out to me was there was a lot of accountability, there was a lot of humility, there was a lot of, you know, hands putting up to say you the certain things you haven't listened to, which I think, you know, you can only respect that if there's someone reading that from, from the community to see, you know, it's been listened to and the um the changes have been addressed. Has it been received like how's the feedback been since the report's been published? I think there's there was a lot of shock. For some people who chose previously not to engage with us or not to tell us what they thought of us, but to sit on the sidelines and boo at us or scream at us or do whatever they wanted to do, um, we've done, we've set out to do what, what, what we wanted to do, which was tell our communities that we are led by you, we are custodians, yeah. we are also human beings, so please treat us with the respect that we deserve and uh, equally we will honour that w with you. Um, there's been a lot of surprise. People did not expect us to, to be so 
honest, so open, so transparent. Um, I guess because we've 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 not been as we've not been great at communicating over the past eighteen months, twenty four months. Yeah. We were focusing on our survival strategy and making sure that we could be there. And throughout that process, while we were really passionately delivering initiatives that were keeping our communities engaged and they thanked us for, some of the, some of the communications that to us now we see that that our audiences really want to know about, we didn't realise they were so important. And I think that's where we lost focus. If we were able to talk to people about exactly the decisions that were being made and why at the time that they were being made, um, it would have really helped our situation. But that's what we strive to do. But we just, we didn't have the resource to do it. And our focus was on making sure that we could su survive. Um, and then there was, you know, there were other extenuating circumstances that meant that we couldn't all be who we had been previously. Um, so the response has been really positive because of that. People can see that, that exactly as you described it, Sean, you know, that's really important to hear that coming from you. It puts a smile on my face because then it's like, OK, great. You can read that independently and see what we've said we'd do. We've done it and this is how we've responded. Um, there's been some, 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 some shock. People didn't expect us uh, not to deliver MCR Pride Live. Even those who were the most vocal detractors that said, you know, why are you doing that? I've come back and, and a little bit tentative now. But well, how are you going to make money? Or, or what are we going to do? You know, there's that level of questioning now. Well, yeah. What's going to go in its place to, 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 to help you achieve your objectives? So is that a process you're now going through to kind of put together the next version of the event? Yeah. So so at the moment, um, off the back of that, and some of the pledges are brilliant. For me, it's, it's so exciting because the world is in a different place in 2022 to where it was in 2019. It, we are a very different place. The pandemic has made us all check in with ourselves, be, be really considered about who we are as people, um, recognising our values and our passions and, and wanting to stand for what's right. Um, and we and I am surrounded by on my team people that have been doing that for years. And what's great now is this level of awareness from others who want to question, who want to challenge, who want to be part of that, but want to see that level of activism back in what a modern pride movement is about because of the hardships faced by LGBT people that the wider world and society, I guess, just didn't realise still existed. So that's going to be the main theme and focus for us on our, on our events this year. Um, and then when it comes to the celebration uh, at, at the Gay Village Party, again, we have a plethora of queer artists and homegrown talent in Greater Manchester and allies, and we want to showcase them. We've got this platform. We know that the world is literally watching what we do in Manchester when it comes to LGBT plus equality and with Manchester Pride, the, the events. Um, and we want to showcase and platform how unique Greater Manchester is and who, who these talents are that, that we have as well as being supported by talent and artists from throughout the UK who yeah. want to come along and champion the cause. So do you know at this stage what it's going to look like or <laughs> kind of get an exclusive? I knew where this was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, yeah. What, one of the things what's really important this year is, is coming through, we started to do it in 2021, is much more co-creation and co-design in everything that we do. Yeah. Um, so the team started having conversations um, with different groups and organisations, uh, community organisations representing um, sub communities within LGBT plus spaces and, and also artists uh, back in January. But the way in which we're going to do this is to make sure that we're being led by communities wherever they can be involved. Um, so we have different stage takeovers, for example, we, where we, we had um, Black Pride MCR, we introduced that um, at the event in 2021. We have Queer Women's Takeover, we're working with Transfield and Joy. So these different collectives who are coming together to program stages with queer talent to showcase and platform them. So it's not a case of, of which people often thought that, that you know, um, Mark Fletcher decided who's going to come and perform for us this year. That's never been the case. I will be part of that programming uh, decision making because, yeah, that's my job. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Supported by a brilliant head of events, Michael, our, our, our booker over the past uh, few years, has been incredible in pulling together and working me on a lineup. And now in our events team, um, one of Michael's team, Chloe, is just so on the ball in making sure that we are connected with those collectives who previously didn't have a connection with, with Manchester Pride or didn't feel that our events were for them because of the format that we've had. And, and now we're saying, no, this is this is everybody's. So come and show us what you've got, take ownership of it, and let's deliver one of the strongest lineups that we can to show the world what, what, what we've got. Um, did I do a really good job there of not telling you who it is that we're, we're bringing on board? <laughs> when, when can we expect to find out more? Um, so this is where I'll be held to task. So because it's taken a little bit longer this year because of the way we are co-curating yeah. and we want to give people the time to, to think and respond to some of the lineups and test them. Um, our, our events manager said to me in a team meeting the other day when I said, so when are we going out with the lineup? 
Uh, she said June. I mean, I nearly fell off my chair. There's, there's no way that we're waiting until then. I'm hoping that we can get it out there by the end of April. Okay. Um, but there's just there's more work to be done to make sure it, it hits the mark on what it needs to do for our communities. So I can tell you, we won't be bringing Christina Aguilera uh, up the M6 to join us. We won't be bringing Miley Cyrus, which was one of the artists that we were really keen to bring and our, our, our audience had told us that we, they wanted us to see back in 2019. Uh, we're not going to be bringing that level of artist to the city to, to celebrate with us this year. And how do you find balancing the expectations? Because it sounds like every big decision you've made, whether it was um, the headliners you brought in, you know, taking out the uh, live element of Manchester Pride Live, big decisions, it's fair to say it's come with controversy along the way. Yeah. Is it almost like, because you've got so many people to consider, is it like whoever shouts the loudest? Cause it's hard to take a sample of every, like everyone yeah. in, in you know what? That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, and whoever shouts the loudest normally is saying the most negative things. That's what we've learned. Uh, a very small number of people will scream and shout the loudest and create a narrative that people then start to believe. And that's dangerous. And that's what happened in 2021. Yeah. And when it comes to genuinely engaging and listening, uh, that there's a lot of work that, that, that my team and I do to making sure that we can hear those lesser heard voices and giving them those opportunities to speak up and, and talk to us about what it is that they would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, so the model that, that we're doing is based on the, the rich feedback that we've had from lots of different communities. Yeah. And what we've had to do is pick on key themes and trends that have come out of that. And one of those key themes was the questioning of the disconnection between MCR Pride Live and the Gay Village Party. And, and those larger pop artists, what we're doing, why we're spending money on those larger pop artists, and yeah. we could be supporting local queer artists. So it, it, it's difficult to listen to, but you have to list, pick out the key themes and trends. We don't listen to those who are shouting loudest. We make sure we listen to those who are afraid to shout as well. And that's the hardest thing, is to reach those who are, are not very fully confident to get their voice out there. It's our job to go and bang in at their door and make them feel comfortable and ask, well, what do you want to see? And we, we started doing that in 2020 and we'll be doing more of that. But it, that's that's the biggest challenge is, is to make sure that we are not led by those who are, who are shouting loudest. What we do in Manchester, our model is, is gonna be so rapidly, uh, so, so radically different from other cities this year when it comes to Pride. You know, it, as a comparison, I mentioned Christine Aguilera jokingly then, but that's, Christine Aguilera is an artist that would be appearing at Brighton Pride, and that's following a similar format that we delivered in 2019, and it works for them. And they've outlined, you know, they have to deliver that format to be able to achieve the objectives that they want to set out to achieve and, and, and raise the level of funds that, that they need. We've just got to get, we have to think differently now. So our commercial modeling that supports the charity and enables us to make sure that we can raise essential funds for those causes that need to be funded throughout Greater Manchester. Uh, we need to think about different ways in which we can do that. So there are a few challenges that, that, that lie ahead and, and what we're doing this year is almost a reset. This is what you told us to do. Here's how we're going to do it. And then all step by step, consult continue to consult how do you feel about this how did it go this year should we do the same next year can we introduce different elements so we'll we'll constantly um, innovate and, and evolve as, as we go forward is there a point where you need to listen to the feedback but you need to apply that feedback in a way that will still get the results of like the 2019 year because i understand the two sides of the argument of yeah. scaling up everything that you do gets more awareness attention press revenue but then also there's the other side of the argument where like you know there's question marks about where people thought the money was going but if you've got to take that feedback on board and say okay we're going to not scale things down we're going to change the model but you it, your job is still to get the you know the same results and the same yeah. Uh, objectives yeah that's a challenge but i told you <laughs> on the offset i love a challenge okay. so so for me that that is quite it is and personally that's a challenge i am commercially motivated so i want to you know and always want our organization to thrive commercially in order that it can um, substantiate the charitable objectives and that for me is so important so commercial success for me is, is growth and growth and growth that can further extend the impact of the charity um, however that question of commerciality from a modern pride movement organizer um, is constantly brought into to context of who we are and what we do engaging with commercial partners um, charging ticket prices for people to attend our events there's, there's a lack of understanding as what's required to be able to deliver an event safely and then also raise thousands of pounds to, 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 to support the causes that our community is asking us to support. So for me, I think we, we more than ever this year, we've got a job of demystifying what it is we do, what we spend money on and how we do it. I've got a staff team. We can't deliver what we deliver without that. Um, but we are, you know, it, it, it's really important for us to explain that to, to our communities so 
they get it. The cost of delivering an event, the infrastructure costs are huge and they're only increasing as every event promoter and organizer will tell you. It's getting more and more difficult. You don't earn a lot of money off, off the sale of a ticket at all. And within our communities, you know, the ticket prices that we're looking at going out with this year are minuscule towards what to what other organizers would have. You can't, you know, I've looked at it, someone told me they're going to an event, um, I think it was ABBA that they were going to, a ticket's costing 165 quid for a concert. Now I'm a bit out of touch and I've got a mate who works at an arena, so I've had a couple of Phoebes over the years. Shh. Um, so I've not bought a concert ticket for such a long time, but obviously doing the competitive analysis of other festivals, I know what they cost and what they charge. And then when you look at what we charge and the lineup that you get and the number of days that we deliver that event that you can attend to, it's constantly questioned. And, and there's that misunderstanding that, that because it's a, a pride event, it should be free. But we're not subsidized or publicly funded, so it can't possibly be free. So yeah. if we want to celebrate who we are and come together, then we have to pay for toilets, we have to pay for infrastructure, we have to pay for security. We have to, we have to design and build this event and that costs a lot of money. And because we are not subsidized, there's this constant dialogue that we're having to explain to people. We need our sponsors. We need to charge ticket prices. Um, it, it, it is what it is. But um, yeah, not, not, not having that, that same level of scalability with, with MCR Pride Live does cause us the challenges. So from a turnover perspective, things will look different. We just have to get more savvy and think about how we can do what we do. But that is going to affect the bottom line. There's no two ways about it. But we have to do that because that's what we've been tasked to do by our communities and we'll see what that looks like. And with the format having changed uh, quite significantly and that well since you've since you've joined, um, is there anything that you'd look back and do differently? Is there any like anything that you think you would approach differently if you went back and did it again? Um, format wise, you know, that's the kind of question that is a big question. Um that that I I often listen to people answer them and when they say what I'm about to say as their first answer I think oh how stupid um, but actually no and and the reason for that no is, be, is because I've learned a lot from doing what I have done and what we have done in the way that we've done it and all the way along we've only done what we did because we were listening to what our community said that they wanted from us so if I had, uh, was, had made a decision boldly myself or thought that I knew better or this is what we're going to do because this is what I think we're going to do, then absolutely I, I would be sitting there thinking, was that the right thing to do? Could we have done it differently? The decisions that, that, that I make are based on what I'm told by the people around me and our stakeholders. So by the time it gets to me announcing that decision, I'm already confident that this is the right thing to do. And if I believe it's the right thing to do because our communities are telling me it's the right thing to do, I have to go along with that conviction. So. And um, when it comes to com communicating, yeah, those are things where I'm like, yeah, we definitely could have done things differently there. I, I, it's always that, oh, I wish we'd have done, I wish we'd have done, why didn't we do that? How did we miss that? Yeah. There's that constant, I think it's really important as part of a self-reflection and to constantly innovate and strive to, to develop as a person or to, or to make improvements that you have to look back and, and self-critique. But when it comes to, to big decisions, it's not just me making them. So I think a collective decision is made by communities and I have to say that the right things were done and if you look back on the history of what it is that we delivered over the past um, eight years, it's been successful, deemed successful by our communities. Yeah. We've enabled us, uh, enabled the charity to achieve its objectives, to grow its impacts, and to, to elevate LGBT artists and performers, whilst also engaging more people than ever before. Um, you know, I think in 2019 we had over 10 billion impacts globally from a media perspective. People talking about Manchester Pride, yeah. and therefore raising that level of awareness. It's fantastic to, fo to, to focus on the issues that are being faced by LGBTQ people. So, so it's an yeah. interesting one. On that note, what have been, you know, it sounds like you've had some, well, a lot of tough things to, to navigate and communicate and, and learn and to take away from that. And I think the most important thing is that you're reflecting on that. And as we can see from the report, um, things are going to change. What have been your proudest moments, most rewarding moments, like when you look back? Wow, uh, proudest moments. Um, proudest moments for me, it's always, it's the same every year, um, is when I see the parade turn the corner um, for the first time and I see it heading towards me wherever I'm stood and I see the tens of thousands of people lying in the streets. Um, it, it's, you know, two, two, two or three times it's literally brought a tear to my eye um, just to see who the people are that are lining up against the streets. It, it, it's our communities coming together and our allies just celebrating who we are 
and that's uniquely Manchester. I've been to other Pride organize, Pride Pride um, events throughout the year, uh, throughout the world, and Manchester Pride does things very differently, and that's because we're in Manchester, and it, and it's it's unique because of the communities that we've got here. We want to champion equality and our freedoms, so that's something that makes me feel so proud and sets me alight. When it comes to other things that I'm proud of, um, we we like to spark change and make sure that we're responding to our audiences. For me, one of the strongest parts of my legacy was the introduction of a new brand identity that we brought in in 2019. We incorporated the black and brown stripes in the freedom flag, uh, and we've since um, adopted the um, the progress flag to bring focus to the issues of racism within LGBT plus communities and safe spaces that queer people of colour were facing. At the time, it was deemed highly controversial. The level of hate that was levelled at me and people of colour at the time was astounding. Um, my peers and, and those organisations that, that, that were closely aligned with me at the time, many of them fell silent, didn't have anything to say, didn't step out into support um, and just remained neutral on the topic. Whereas literally hundreds and if not thousands um, of, of people of, of very similar demographics took to social media to question how dare I do this 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 type of thing um, it's not needed and within that was a subtext of racism targeted at me which for the world to see was a clear validation as to why we have done what it is that we've done um, a lot of LGBT plus safe spaces were not safe and are still not safe for queer people of colour and we wanted to draw focus to, to that issue and I'm so proud that when I look back at this three years later you can't walk down a street at the time of a pride celebration now without seeing that black and brown stripe and now an inclusion of the trans colours on that flag as well for me that makes me incredibly proud because I know we we, we didn't start that conversation but we elevated that conversation mm. um, which should become part of a global movement and a change in understanding as to what it means to be part of a community and that pride cannot be for every for, for, for anyone unless it's for everyone and, and and taking that forward when, when, when i see especially and you know large organizations around the world um and commercial organizations adopting that flag uh, and showing support for their their staff networks and, and wider society that that makes me really proud because i know that came from a decision that that, that i made uh, based on the experiences of queer people of color and my own experiences as a queer person of color yeah the cup the cup uh, my takeaway from that was the coverage from that opened up so many important debates and conversations that weren't happening before so all, some some positive some negative but that conversation happened like needed to happen and yeah. and and, uh, and that caused it so yeah i think that was um, it did and it's still going today and there's a lot of work that needs to be done there but i'm i'm proud that we can have that conversation openly and that people are having the confidence to talk about their lived experiences. That's it's the only way we're really going to see positive changes through doing that. So with your, um, I guess, your role and everything that's on your plate, it's it's so high pressure and there's so many of these big decisions, as we've just spoke about, that can spark such big change um, for, for better or for worse. Just having that on your shoulders and your plate, do you ever, do you ever suffer from burnout? Do you ever suffer from... Yeah, so here's the thing. I'm, I've been really bad um, at recognising when burnout is coming. I like to keep on going and going and going and going and going. Uh, for me, it's really important that I look after the well-being um, of my team and of my family. So I'll always be the one that's looking out for them, but often neglecting myself. So I know what I need to do and when I need to do it, but I love my work and there's so much to do. It's never ending. So I have to really work hard to make sure I check in with myself and give myself that time to switch off, back off, and just chill it keeps that productivity levels at the, the level that i want to be yeah but um yeah i you know i'll be honest with you and say there are a couple of times where i've reached burnout and i didn't see it coming and it's terrified me when i look back now i think wow I, that, that was a whole day of blackout or that was a whole kind of i can't my, my, my mind saying not knowing what to do next and as somebody who likes to have the answers for everything when that when that hits you you know you really just got to stop now and take a step back um, for any of us in any 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 role, especially a leadership role, the role can be uh, as big as you want it to be, and it can really um, engulf you. And I guess you just need to be aware of that and, and humanise yourself within it, understanding that as, as individuals we all have of, of our limits. And what's really important is to look after yourself. Um, it's something that I have to constantly remind myself. It doesn't come naturally to me. To, to put myself first and to think about what what I need, if if I'm honest. Again, Why like thinking of it as a CEO as well. You've got your team who you might spot burn out, and you can kind of you know, final weeks of the festival, we've, we've all been there. It's yeah. Hectic, so you can kind of try and spot that and help them. But 
Who can spot it and help you? Well, I've got a brilliant team. So over the past couple of years, they have. There's one person in particular that comes to mind, and, and she first started doing this in 2018, um, just coming up to me. Mark, how are you? And it's the first, I didn't quite know what to do when she asked me. It's the first kind of, wow. It what? shakes you when someone it does, asks you yeah, that, well, like... And she meant it, and she was not moving until I told her how I was. And she was looked, she was staring into my soul when she said it, you know, not just, a, oh, how are you? How are you? Yeah. So I was like, um, I just had to take a minute. And I said, um, I'm good. Uh, I'm a bit hungry and a bit tired, but, but I'm good. But it made me check in with myself. Yeah. From there on in, we, we thrive upon a culture <laughs> of... of self-awareness and self-care but also team awareness and team care so that helps when you know yourself when you when you get to the final stages of festival it's so busy everyone's adrenaline is pumping so much you're on such a high that you could literally work three days solid mm. without sleep unless you you know you, your body tells you you've got to stop so um yeah it's good to have people around me like that that check in with me i think i think i'm very fortunate to have a team that that cares who cares about me and um and a team, this is something I sound really sad, a team that likes me, I think that makes all, all the difference. Um, there must be some likeable qualities for me if, it, if, if they can care about how I am, right? <laughs> You're what, what all right. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so for any, I guess what we try and do with the, the podcast and with Business Keeps On Dancing is just try and, especially for me, it's probably, I'm quite selfish, just trying to find out how you've, um, how you've achieved everything that you have and try and learn uh, some things myself as well. So we're always trying to think, what, what are those secrets to success? And I know it's a hard thing to um, to bottle, um, but, you know, for any budding CEOs out there or event producers, yeah. what's your best advice to achieving great things in your career? So a couple of things there. Event producers, um, be the best that you can be by listening, by watching, by looking at what's working and by asking your ticket buyers and your audiences what they want. You will learn the most from that. It's so interesting because... We we're supposed to many event owners, but I guess you've got um, a greater need to do that, as 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 we spoke about. But so many festivals don't, and it got me thinking about surveys and focus groups, and just yeah, get that yeah idea of co-design is I think a powerful tool for it for is. Festivals. And as we move forward over the next few years, by doing that, you're going to engage many more people. If people can feel they take take ownership of your event and that sense of belonging, it's only going to go from strength to strength. Um, from a CEO perspective, um, I've learned just to, to, to be me. When, when I look at my successes, whatever they are or however I judge them, um, I feel I'm being most successful when I've just been able to sit there and just be me. Um, don't be afraid to, to live and abide by your values. You know, Whatever they are, we all have different values. Some of them are shared, some of them are not. If you think about them, if you can define them, and I love the way in which you have, shown that level of awareness, maybe just list them to yourself. And every decision that you're making, refer back to your values. Is this decision going to make uh, going to align with values? Is this behavior going to align with values? Um, and if it does, then you're going to be on the right track to making sure that you, you're going to achieve your success based on whatever that looks like and, that, and that, that will look differently for all of us based on our values. Other than that, I will say there is no college degree um, for learning how to be a CEO. Um, everybody has to find their own way. And I, I'd say that obviously from my perspective, but I now work in an environment with many different CEOs and leaders at different levels, um, locally, regionally, nationally and globally. And what I've learned is that we've all have our own different paths um, you're only as strong as the team that you surround yourself with and, and don't be afraid to recognize that you have limitations as a person. You can't do everything yourself. Um, but for me, it's just that level of integrity and, and authenticity that allows me to, to step out each day and, and know that what I'm doing is, is aligned with, with who I am. And yeah, that's it. Just be you, yo. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've done all right so far, it's fair, fair to say. Thank you. Have you got any, um, do you have like long-term plans two three four years or do you kind of just deal with what's okay in well like most leaders yeah of course sean i'm a control <laughs> freak man so yeah i've i've i have the best laid plans i've learned since the pandemic struck the best laid plans can go amiss and i i welcomed and i allowed uh, a level of chaos into my life i don't thrive of chaos chaos i find really distracting and it's not an environment that i'm comfortable in um but i welcomed it and I welcomed it for a period of, of 18 months to two years through things going on in my personal life and through things going on in my professional life. I've learned a lot from it, uh, but it's not for me. So yeah, the plan is to get back on track. Um, no, I, <laughs> when it comes to, I, I love, I, I feel you have to, for me, I have to follow a plan. I like to know where I'm going. Yeah. But by introducing chaos into my life as well, I've learned that not that, that I, I don't need that level of rigidity. Yeah. I just need to have a, a clear, fluent understanding, of, well, yeah, fluid understanding of where I'm going. 
Um, so when I, in terms of, of, of my plan and what comes next, I'm trying to take each day as it comes, but wanting to make sure that I can, I can feel, uh, I can experience, and I can live in current times because I know we're living in an incredibly unique time and, and the world is faced by challenge after challenge. Um, and the sense of community and togetherness that I'm experiencing from, from friends, family, peers and colleagues uh, is something that I just want to harness uh, and get a sense of guiding me along, along, along my, my way over the next three to five years. I don't know what's there, whereas previously I had a very clear idea as to what, what, what will be there. I don't know what's, what, what's ahead. I don't know what's in three or five years, but uh, at the minute I'm doing 12 months at a time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, can't, can't, see where you're, uh, can't wait to see what you're going through now. Thank you. But thank you so much for coming in. And I just want to say thank you for being so so honest and candid. You know, it's you've tackled a lot of big questions today. And as, um, uh, as I started off the podcast with, Under the Spotlight is probably um, what you are every day in, in yeah. what you do. So, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and, and being so honest about all of your, your learnings and takeaways. Well, it's because of you making me feel comfortable to be able to do that. So thanks for inviting me on. Um, yeah, I know I've done a lot of talking today. And I'm not the kind of person that would usually talk about myself. Uh, I've learned to talk more about my lived experiences over the past few years. Um, but you've definitely, I feel you definitely scratched me to the surface. I can't even remember what you've asked me and what I've said. So I know it's come <laughs> from my heart. I, ho I hope it's what you uh, what you wanted. I oh, know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot today and I'm sure everyone who tunes in will um, as, as well. As have I. Have and I. yeah, we'd love, to, um, we'd love to get you back on another time as well. Let's see where that plan takes us, eh? Yeah. All right, go on. Take care. Thanks, Sean.